collect your verdict. Give us the answer. Sir, we know that you started your practice in trial court in Trivandrum. So could you just uh, take us uh, to, to the journey till there? That was uh, more than half a century back. Uh, I got enrolled uh, in the High Court of Kerala in 1956 and uh, for a an year and a half I was practicing with a senior advocate in Trivandrum. This is the place where I am born and brought up and the district court happened to be just next door to my house. I used to be living in a different house uh, in Vanchiur where the courts are located. So that was in uh, 1956. I continued that practice for uh, an year and a half. And it was in 1958 I left for uh, Aligarh uh, Muslim University where I got a teaching assistantship, uh, which was uh, the advice of my professor in uh, Trivandrum, Dr. A.T. Marcos. So his friend was the Dean of the Aligarh Muslim University Law Faculty, Professor Hafizur Rahman. And uh, they gave me a small uh, salary or a scholarship, you may say. And I did my LLM along with the teaching assistantship in Aligarh University right from 1959. So that was the start of my academic career and shifting this uh, the advice of uh, my professor Dr. Marcos that I would make a good career in uh, the academic field rather than in the practicing profession. This was uh, my mother was very reluctant to leave me at that time because I am the only uh, son. Uh, of course I had my younger brother who died later. So she was very reluctant and would have liked me to continue in Trivandrum but I decided to take it up and persuaded her and uh, went to Aligarh and uh, continued in Aligarh till 1965 uh, when I got appointed to the Delhi University Law Faculty. But there was no turning back from the academic career ever since I started it in 59. And you know last year I completed 50 years of teaching uh, which was celebrated by the Indian Society of uh, Law Firms uh, where they gave an award of a lakh of rupees and instituted an award in my name. They call it the Professor N. R. Madhav Menon Best Law Teacher Award. So the second year it was awarded recently to a Bangladesh law professor, Professor Misanur Rahman. Now this will be continued year after year. So. Throwing back memories 50 years uh, uh, earlier, I remember that uh, the time was quite different, practice was quite different. I started off in the criminal side, which I liked of course, had some experience in conducting cases uh, along with my senior, in some cases minor matters, he used to advise me to go uh, for the lower courts. But that was a period in which uh, uh, not much payment was there. Whatever was the, the senior was giving, that was what uh, I used to get. So in fact, to make some extra money, I used to uh, participate in some radio programs, in the All India Radio. Uh, you know, some small skits, they used to assign some roles and at that time for an half an hour program they used to give 50 rupees so which was an big actor money also, yes an actor. <laughs> not an actor it's a radio program so only voice is heard but uh, you may say that uh, in a sense i took some roles uh, which they assigned not so much for the love of acting but to make some extra money to meet both ends meet that's all otherwise you know I lost my father at the age of two years and uh, my mother brought me up and there was no proper counselling as to what career I should be taking etc. But uh, my mother did not uh, want me to go away from Trivandrum. Were you and, a first generation lawyer? No, I am, uh, well, with my family I am the first lawyer but I have my uncle who was practicing. Uh, my 
cousin brother who was also practicing but not in uh, trivandrum they were practicing in chertalai and that is our original uh, home but uh, the practice at that time was not that remunerative people used to say that at least for 5 to 10 years you have to struggle in the profession to be able to get uh, make money for a living so you have to have some other activity along with practice unless your family is able to support you for 4 or 5 years that was not my situation so i necessarily had to i used to teach in a tutorial college also so that was for uh, higher secondary students uh, so that brought some money the radio brought some money and so they if the, if the monetary side of a practice was taken care of would we have lost mother marina as the academic well uh, not perhaps so because uh, i loved uh, teaching also you know as i told you in the tutorial college though i was not teaching law i was teaching english and mathematics uh, so therefore i loved teaching as well so when this advice from my professor came i preferred that profession to the practice of law well nobody knows as to how uh, you know your fate will shape you up and uh, once i went to north and started teaching in aligarh university uh, where i became uh, you know a lot of things a president of the malayali association uh, the president the, uh, the the captain of the uh, aligarh muslim university riding club and the warden of uh, sir sayed hall a hostel of uh, aligarh university so this multiple responsibilities at a very young age uh, i was there hardly 22 at that time so all this uh, uh, made me perhaps uh, learn the different facets of life and the career was also at that time the salary was only 650 rupees i used to save some money and send to my mother here so it was all right it went off well uh, uh, only thing is that in 1965 there was an episode in aligarh where the vice chancellor was assaulted uh, by some students of the aligarh university some of them happened to be my uh, hostel uh, inmates so that uh, resulted in a you know police uh, uh, taking away some of my students from my hostel i happened to be a witness for against them so it was a, a, a sad incident uh, which persuaded me to look for a change and luckily for me the offer from delhi university came that's how i moved after 5 6 years in aligarh to delhi and uh, delhi of course was at that time trying to shape uh, or sort of reform the then system of legal education under a very distinguished professor p k tripathi and that gave me an opportunity to experiment uh, with different styles of teaching delhi was at that time introducing what is called the case method of law study with some ford foundation assistants i happened to be sponsored uh, for a year long pro- program in uh, columbia university law school in usa under this ford exchange program and that was a very pleasant time i was uh, giving some seminars attending some lectures of some distinguished people and trying to learn how law is being taught in the american setting there was i was not pursuing any degree or anything i was a visiting scholar under the ford program i traveled widely in many law schools across america interacted with many professors uh, that's where i observed some aspects of clinical law teaching where the skills are being taught so at the end of that year when i returned to delhi i had initiated for the first time what is called the legal aid clinic Uh, that was way back in 1969 so within 10 years i became a sort of a clinical law teacher you may say and had the experience of taking my students to the tihar jail to the police stations and uh, you know the the law teaching and law learning became uh, more uh, active 
active and uh, more participatory and uh, more in social context rather than mere classroom based lecturing uh, well the legal aid clinic uh, experience at that time brought me i mean got me appointed as a member of the government of india appointed uh, legal aid committee expert committee on legal aid and justice v r krishnayar was the chairman of that committee so from the academic side i was appointed that gave me an opening to impress upon my colleagues in the academic world as to how the association of students with legal aid would enable them to understand legal problems in context and to learn the skills of advocacy and that was a sort of a turning point i should say uh, in law teaching both in delhi as well as in few other places i travel widely with justice krishnayar and justice bhagavati uh, canvassing for lok adalats which was then beginning under justice bhagavati's uh, i continued to be a member of the expert committee on legal aid and a committee for implementing legal aid schemes for almost uh, a de- two decades so and when did the law school idea originate well after that i uh, took uh, leave from delhi university and joined the bar council of india as the first secretary of the bar council of india trust uh, my job was mainly to advise the bar council of india on legal education reforms on their legal education committee and also to publish a journal on behalf of the bar council the indian bar review was started by me also to give continuing education for lawyers i used to go on behalf of the bar council and conduct continuing education program for a week or two weeks in different parts of india for lawyers of different periods of experience well in the process i could persuade the bar council of india for some radical restructuring of legal education i also got some insights into how the profession was functioning i did some research on the problems of young lawyers in tamil nadu published a book on behalf of the bar council on the indian legal profession i published another book under the bar council of india auspices on the legal education status and reforms so at the end of the day the bar council agreed to institute a five year llm llb program we called it the five year integrated uh, llb program there were not many takers at that time uh, some universities were reluctantly trying to experiment with a five year program but side by side with this conceiving of the five year program the national law school idea was born and the bar council ventured to initiate a law school to experiment with this five year program and demonstrate that it could be a better alternative to the previously existing program so why karnataka sir well we scouted many places so many state bar councils sounded the state uh, governments there were offers from uh, allahabad Uh, calcutta uh, and uh, karnataka karnataka the then chief minister um, uh, so, uh, mr hegde uh, promised to give not only land uh, legislation uh, but also give uh, 50% of the initial expenses from the government and bangalore of course was attractive for uh, it was a sort of developing as an educational capital of india i had no experience in ba- bangalore so when i was offered in 1985 whether i could uh, set up what the bar council of india called the harvard of the east uh, i discussed with my wife we were very comfortable in delhi i was a professor and head of the department of delhi i was a member of the law commission of india at that time i had a gone a university offered quarters very close to my faculty so many of my colleagues dissuaded me saying look who will come for this five year law education there are plenty of colleges already who will pay the cost for it where do you find the money the bar council was prepared to pay only 25 lakhs for the entire enterprise 
the Karnataka government promised an equal amount. So the National Law School was to be started in Karnataka with 50 lakhs of rupees. Who will sustain and how it will be? It was we were in the dark. So my my wife said, if you want to experiment and innovate, here is an opportunity. And we should take the risk. So I finally decided, in despite my Dean Professor Tripathi's advice and many of my colleagues dissuading me, to take the risk. Unless you take risks, there are no possibility of any reform uh, being made. Well, uh, when, we, when I went to Bangalore, and I was going to Bangalore for the first time, at that time to set up the National Law School. We were put in a sort of a shed. Uh, it was a, a parking lot converted into a shed, uh, which was in Central College, Bangalore, which was already part of the Bangalore University. So the Bangalore University people were not very hospitable. You know, in fact, they did not like why another university within. A, but Karnataka government and the Bar Council of Karnataka was very supportive. The legislation which ensured total autonomy for the university was uh, prepared by us uh, keeping the, the uh, Chief Justice of India as the visitor and an independent board consisting of the bar, the bench and the academia. So the, draft the draft was prepared by us. Karnataka government promulgated it as an ordinance to create the National Law School very quickly. So, the initial difficulties of setting up a university were always there. We were scouting for a better land, uh, building, hostel. We wanted it to be residential. But to put it shortly, facing all those challenges, facing the opposition of some of the vested interests, we set up the law school, announced the program, we deliberated, I made a recruitment of faculty after a prolonged interview and discussion which extended for three days. About 150 people applied for positions in a non-existent university. Finally, we were a team of about nine people, including me, eight teachers and myself. We had three month long discussion on what the law school should be like, what its program should be like, what we should be teaching how, all sorts of things. We decided to make it a trimester. Perhaps uh, in India, National Law School was the first institution to have three terms. In each term, five courses. So much so, at the end of five years, the students will have studied 50 courses, which was something unique at that time. So we decided that we must teach the Bar Council prescribed compulsory courses which will constitute only half of our curriculum, 50%. The other 50% we should offer optional subjects, enabling students to specialize. We decided we must teach the social science subjects integrated with law to enable the students studying sociology, understand family law, labor law, criminal law more uh, meaningfully. The economics to be taught in a manner that all the economic related subjects starting from contracts to company law and tax law more understandable. Political science, public law related. So we, we integrated the subject and in order to integrate we designed our own syllabus. We created our own study materials. We trained ourselves how to go for teaching and we decided we will go jointly. The sociology teacher along with the law teacher political science teacher along with the law teacher. And there will be interaction in the class to be able to really give the benefit of an integrated understanding of the subject to the students. We called it cooperative teaching. It was miraculous success. In fact, I remember in the course on legal method, myself and four other teachers were in the class regularly for a month. From, it was fun for students. Everybody was... was eh? How was the reaction? The reaction was so enthusiastic that students took sides with different teachers. So much so, we were also in an adversarial mode to provoke the students to think beyond their, uh, you know, books or materials or things like that. 
uh, it was really uh, this the starting point of a revolutionary movement in clinical in legal education involving the students in an enthusiastic lively class asking questions which are uncomfortable to the teachers and finding no answers but leaving it at that i mean i never we never look back and the money was the problem we had to build a campus the karnataka government persuaded the bangalore university to part with 20 acres of land which was an area which was a forest like nagar bhavi it is called there were full of snakes and serpents and all that nothing else but we took it we tried to mobilize some resources with the help of the bar council with leading lawyers uh, mobilize some funds and started constructing uh, slowly the first uh, thing that we constructed in the in the campus was the boys hostel plus the director's residence and i moved in while the construction was going on so i had experience with snakes in the those period particularly my wife and children but we enjoyed it because we were building a great institution which was destined to change the course of legal education not only in india but perhaps in the neighboring countries as well so it was an exciting experience every day every moment living with that uh, uh, idea of innovation and creating something new which i cannot explain i had uh, spoken on it in the pavate memorial lectures in karnataka university the making of the law school uh, it is recorded also in my biography which was published last year turning point but i mean when the finances became a problem in the third year of the law school we were almost thinking of how to pay salaries to the teachers and teachers were taking the minimum not even the ugc recognized salary because there was not money enough i made a detailed account of the expenditure the collection of fees and other donations etc and wrote a letter to the parents of all the students that i may have to close down after a year if i have no money to pay the teachers and keep the quality of education at this level according to me that if the fees is raised 10 times i may be able to survive believe me you i got replies from all the parents some of them telling that you don't have to ask us to give this much we are prepared to give more but keep it up and in uh, 1989 uh, i raised the tuition fee which was originally 2500 to 25000 without a murmur all the students paid the fee and i got six parents paying 25000 more towards the fees and expenses this again is something which is which is unknown or unprecedented in the field of higher education of course later on the national law school increased it now i am told it is 75000 or 1 lakh or something like that the student admission was perfectly through merit with nobody being able to influence only the meritorious used to come there we had of course the reservation for the scheduled caste scheduled tribes which again i must tell you that these students who had some initial problems they were put with senior students as mentors to be able to pick up the language communication and overcome their disabilities in studies so i can tell you that the the students who have come through the reserved quota were as brilliant as they passed out along with the others so much so they had no difficulty in getting campus recruitment so this in all matters you know it was a such a revealing experience in fact in 1992 uh, the then chief minister of west bengal came to study this as he heard that something big is happening here and he came to bangalore visited the national law school unannounced and we had a talk and um, later on as it would have when i decided after about 11 years of service we wanted to call it a day and return to trivandrum but uh, immediately thereafter i got a call from mr jyoti basu saying that now since you have relinquished your office there 
would you come and set up a university like that in uh, Calcutta? Initially, I said I would advise, but I would, don't think that I can go along with this trauma once again. But he finally persuaded me. I, I landed up in 1999 in Calcutta to set up the National University of Juridical Sciences, where my emphasis was slightly different uh, in the sense that in Bangalore, the idea was to integrate social sciences with law and to give a social context education with the clinical programs, the project work and things like that. In Calcutta, we tried to integrate the curriculum with physical and natural sciences and offer courses which have these sciences in the curriculum. So we wanted the students to specialize in maritime law, in petroleum laws, in air and space laws, in telecommunication laws, intellectual property laws, where physical and natural sciences knowledge will enrich the understanding of law relating to those sciences, medicine, engineering, applied sciences. I could not complete my, I built the, it's another big story, where taking a loan from uh, HDFC, building the campus within a record time of two years, moving in there. When I completed four years, a call came from the Supreme Court of India that the Supreme Court would like me to set up the National Judicial Academy at Bhopal. So the Chief Justice of India was the Chancellor of the University also. They asked the, the West Bengal government to relieve me from that post. I had to find my successor. I could find uh, a person from JNU to take over. And in 2003, I moved to Bhopal for setting up the Judicial Academy for training the the superior court judges, the senior district judges and the high court judges, where I spent another three and a half, four years. By the time I became 72, 73, I, I, my wife said, why do you work like this? We must go back. So in uh, 2006, I requested the Supreme Court to leave me, where again they asked me to find a substitute. One of my former students who succeeded me in uh, National Law School, Mohan Gopal, agreed to go there. I got relieved and came back to Trivandrum. This is my academic journey from legal education to judicial education and uh, completing nearly 50 years academic career. And uh, now I am settled here, working in few committees of uh, the Government of India. But after relinquishing that job, the government wanted me to join the Commission on Center State Relations. Uh, I thought I could do from Trivandrum, but it was hard task going twice, thrice every month to Delhi. So I moved to Delhi for a couple of years with my wife, completed that assignment and came back to Trivandrum only earlier this year. I hope I will have... Till the next call comes. Huh? Till I do. <laughs> you may say so, but now we have decided not to take up any regular job at all under any circumstances. But I'll continue so long as the health permits. I'm now 76, so I do not think that I should be able to uh, take a, an employment like that. But I am in few committees of the MHRD uh, ministry. I'll go to Delhi now and then. And I, my students in Trivandrum and my friends have set up a institute called the Menon Institute of Legal Advocacy Training. We offer some programs for young lawyers to uh, compete in the profession by some sort of a finishing school exercise. I also give some uh, continuing education courses for lawyers in association with the Bar Association under the Menon Institute. And I have a program to introduce uh, what I call education for responsible citizenship in higher secondary schools where I bring in some knowledge of uh, the legal system, the constitution uh, and their role and responsibility as a good citizen. I wish I, I have some energy and some uh, support services uh, to be able to do that. It perhaps working out, hopefully I'll do that. And that's all what uh, the remaining agenda for my... 
Sir, uh, your law school has been a great success. The law school model has been replicated. But when you look at the graduates passing out of law school, are they doing justice to the education they have got? Are they working as social engineers? Are they actually making a difference to the practice of law as we know? I understand the question. Many of the Chief Justices of India have asked me why is it that you allow this campus recruitment and let them be taken away by these corporates or law firms? Well, the choice is theirs. Uh, I am happy to say a small percentage of students refuse to go for this campus recruitment and are joining NGOs or starting their own practice in the district towns. I encourage them. Uh, there are difficulties, as you know, to start. I myself know as to how I started in '56. I told you. Uh, no, we have to develop a model and there must be a support from the Bar Council and the government to enable bright young lawyers to set up their own offices in district towns. I have a model in mind, a lawyer's cooperative or a lawyer's collective. Uh, I recommend it uh, in many places and even drafted a partnership deed for like-minded young law graduates to be able to set up practice. Now bank loans are available. And I said that I will contact senior advocates and give them work. You know, it may be research and drafting or something like that, so that they have some regular income. Then you have to work in the villages, you must understand social reality and must be able to come up slowly. Well, that may happen. But I would say your question of becoming social engineers, even when they work in a law firm, I would imagine that they are advising the corporates to use law in a sustainable manner. To, uh, to of course, business uh, have to have their returns. But I should think that these students are assisting them to uh, do corporation, uh, corporate activity with social responsibility. So therefore, you cannot say that when they work with the corporate office, they are not social engineers. Wherever they work, they will uh, work responsibly. That is the part of education that I think I have given them. Okay. Now, uh, coming to another area, is that, sir, uh, about the quality of faculty in law schools. Do we have sustainable pool of faculty for all? I know at present, I, I do think that we do not have inadequate numbers uh, quality teachers. Uh, there is a, a reform proposal from the Honorable Law Minister Virappa Moili uh, to uh, improve the quality of LLM education with a view to prepare teachers for the uh, the integrated law education, clinical education and things. I, I am in that process. I, I in the Menon Institute, gives continuing education for law teachers. And we try to prepare them how to teach ethics, how to teach different skills, how to teach lawyers preparing them for mediation, arbitration and other ADR systems. So that the entire focus on litigation and corporate work is diverted to other socially relevant techniques of uh, legal services. I think it's an agenda which the government of India has already taken up. In association with law schools, I think we will have a steady supply of good teachers who will be able to take it forward. Hopeful of that. Now the conditions of service of teachers have considerably improved and the professor gets about a lack of rupees, I am told. So I started off with 650 rupees. That's a different story. Sir, uh, now to take a slight shift. Uh, now, what are your views on the judicial accountability? And what, what is the state of judiciary today? What can be done uh, to bring judicial discipline back if there is a need to do so? I suppose I emphasize as a teacher, I emphasize on training. You know, the, the law graduate, when he becomes a judge, he is supposed to be under training for one year in a judicial academy. And we have designed the program at the National Judicial Academy in Bhopal in consultation with the state academies 
we had the first judicial pay commission report also on judicial training which i had the good fortune to write uh, you would find that by training you can sensitize the judges you can make them accountable you can make them keep integrity of the judicial office so i am hopeful of the future but uh, talking about judicial accountability of the superior court judges well there have been a lot of public discussion on that issue a new bill judicial inquiry and accountability bill is in the offing it is unfortunate that a section of judges have not been keeping judicial ethics the way they are expected to uh, we are on the verge of impeaching uh, one or two judges including a chief justice this is a sad part and i suppose we cannot afford to allow uh, a few judges here and there tarnish the image of indian judiciary which is very very high around the world the quality of justice is appreciated all around the world public interest litigation is our contribution to world judiciary now therefore we it is a is a warning signal and the accountability will have to be very uh, tightly uh, enforced if the judges themselves do it well and good otherwise it should come from outside the national the judicial commission is perhaps a, a felt necessity in superior judiciary falling short of impeachment what can be done no there are provisions in the judicial uh, inquiry and accountability bill which is final now the law minister will introduce any day it has provisions short of impeachment to discipline judges which may be taking away work from them even asking them to go on retirement compulsory retirement or transferring them or warning them there are a variety of intermediate punishments uh, for judicial misdemeanors which is part of the bill that is because the the code of ethics which was adopted during chief justice verma's time unanimously by the supreme court have unfortunately not been honored by a few judges of the high court so therefore we have now some compulsion to follow those norms which are now being adopted in the judicial accountability bill so i am quite sure that this is a minor aberration and we need not tarnish the entire judiciary for this aberration of few judges here and there the accountability bill will take care of it oh uh, a lot has to change i if you ask me to start a new law school uh, in 2010 i will not bring it in the model of the national law school that's now outmoded both in curriculum as well as in methods so the next generation of legal education reforms will have to be founded more on skills education uh, more on science law interface uh, more on ethics uh, more on socially relevant themes must get into the curriculum of the new generation of legal education reforms i should think that uh, we can teach law around skills if you want to give a really socially relevant legal education i would even say that the next generation of uh, legal education should be known as justice education not legal education uh, you know as i am fond of saying as doctors are concerned with health rather than disease lawyers should be concerned with justice rather than disputes so this transformation must be reflected in the curriculum in the pedagogy in the entire uh, experiential learning that you want to give to the new generation lawyers you know we have to move towards alternate dispute resolution from litigation which means a world of change in the training program and the the unfortunate developments both in judiciary and in the profession because of the weak ethical foundation of lawyering will have to be restored how do you do that well today we are teaching ethics as a small module in a final semester of the law program 
I think ethics education should start from day one of the five year in the legal education program. I mean, how do you do that? It has to be a variety of activities. You know, you can't teach ethics by lecturing. You have to involve students in activities where the student is called upon to make ethical decisions in real life and help them resolve in what you consider as the ethical way of resolution. Yeah, I remember that when the Gujarat earthquake happened, I was uh, teaching in the uh, National University of Juridical Sciences in Kolkata, 2002. I took a batch of 15 students and a couple of professors the very next day to Kutch. Our mission was to expose the students to the human suffering for which legal answers have to be found. The general impression is that when an earthquake happens and so much of devastation, the doctors and the firefighting, the police and the other people, but not the lawyers. I thought that law has a role to play and I want the students to experience instead of my explaining to them. So we came across orphan children, widowed uh, women, uh, people asking for relief and rehabilitation, medical assistance. And after 14 days stay and interaction with people and doing whatever little we could do on the spot, we came back with a report to Ahmedabad which we presented to the Chief Justice of the Gujarat High Court. There was a PIL pending at that time, complaining about the rehabilitation, relief and all measures. The Chief Justice has acknowledged our report and mentioned in his judgment and gave some of the orders which we have said. We said that there must be a, a, a NGO activity to collect these orphan children and see that they are given in adoption. Uh, facilitate by procedures which are legally acceptable. We said there must be a team which should be legal aid team which should be assisting the people to get the provident fund money, the life insurance money without asking questions in the bureaucracy of the life insurance corporation. They have no document to produce but the insurance corporation have the records. So I said that law has a very proactive role to play in such disasters. And the students, believe me you, there are a couple of people who are now working in Gujarat with NGOs. That is only because of the, what they saw in real life in Kutch. They were so moved and I should say that they are the people who are most ethical in the profession today. It's one instance in one's life is enough to take to the ethical path whichever career you take. Of course, everybody needs money. But in your ethical dilemmas as a professional, how should you be, uh, which course you should be taking? I remember what Gandhiji said. When you are to make a decision, he, he said in connection with lawyers and judges, that when you have to make a decision and you ask yourself the question, which decision will wipe the tears of larger number of eyes? And the right decision will be taking that course. That is possible only when you develop sensitivity to human suffering, for which law has to find the answers. So, I mean, how can you bring this sort of experiential learning in a law school environment? That is the question which the next generation of legal education will have to answer. Are you happy with the sort of academic research that's being conducted in law schools and the output coming from there? Where is academic research? I mean, I don't call it research. They are just, uh, you know, the, the initial uh, compiling from judgments and uh, 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 research report, uh, reports and something which is written elsewhere. It's called... Uh, Real research has not happened yet in legal education. We try to inculcate it in the new generation of lawyers, not the law teachers, but the law students, uh, when we assign them what you call the projects in every subject and ask them to go and research in their own way, find a methodology and write 20 pages by way of a research paper. 
those people at the end of five years have developed research skills, which law teachers have not yet developed. So to cultivate a real research which are needed for our country today, what we are trying to do is uh, trying to do in the sense the government of India under the National Knowledge Commission of which I was also a member of their legal group recommended establishing five legal research centers, advanced research centers. The central government should pay 50 crores to each center and this will be linked up with the law colleges and a new research culture of innovative research, a research which will benefit the society Research will lead to law reform or new legislations. All this will have to be developed by a research center which I believe cannot happen in the law school at present. But by a research center linked up with the law school so that eventually you will have as many law schools as many research centers, maybe 10 years, 20 years hence. But this must happen as the government of India set up the the Council of Industrial Research, you know, number of industrial research centers were set up to support industry. So similarly in, in 2010, Government of India should set up the law research centers to support the new generation of economic reform and access to justice for those who are outside the legal system. So that's what I want to say about research because research cannot be done merely by studying statutes and judicial decisions you must take the social science research methods and bring it into the focus of law. That's what is to happen. Uh, I am told that the government has decided in principle to support legal research uh, like that. Justice being the most important thing, how do you view the recent judgment in uh, the Bhopal case? Well, it's a sad story. I remember uh, Justice Krishnayar uh, speaking about uh, Bhoposhima, comparing it to Hiroshima tragedy. It's, a, it's sad because the Indian legal community, academics included, have not responded the way that we ought to have responded for a tragedy of that proportion. Either people were benumbed, not knowing how to react, or the lawyers were to be woken up by the American lawyers coming down and uh, putting in vakalats on behalf of the hundreds and thousands of people in total misery. Justice was denied in that case. Hats off to that district judge of Bhopal who gave an interim order of 400 crores of rupees, which is something unprecedented under the civil justice system in our country. But the judiciary has failed the Bhopal victims. The legal profession has totally failed the Bhopal victims. The academics, well, they have limitations, they could not do much. I mean, the government has failed. The question that we need to ask now is, have we learned the lessons? I should only say that in a small way we have responded in National Law School Bangalore where we introduced a full semester long course on the Bhopal tragedy. We called it Mass Tots. It was a second course in Tots entirely with the documentation available on the Bhopal tragedy. And how could the legal system respond more responsibly if a a similar thing, God forbid, were to happen. And uh, the students are now fairly well aware of the Sri Ram Gasly case and the principle of uh, absolute liability, uh, the, the amendments to the law, the Factories Act and the Public Insurance Act and so many other uh, constitutional tort which is now available in our country in such cases. So you don't have to drag on in the civil courts and the criminal courts, you can get quick constitutional remedies by invoking the constitutional tort if such a thing were to happen. So the law students were enabled to uh, uh, find innovative ways of lawyering and getting relief and rehabilitation to mass tort victims 
from the lessons of the Bhopal tragedy. That is one thing that has happened in the academic world after the Bhopal gas leak. Now I am sure that the expertise has been developed and the judges also have learned their lesson how they should be responding if such a thing were to happen. We have now the Nuclear Liability Act also. I think, you know, government also has now packages available. Things will be different. But justice ought to be done if that were to happen. The immediate question is what more justice can be given to those who were denied justice and who are still suffering in Bhopal. I spent four years in Bhopal in the Judicial Academy and every training program that I did for High Court judges and District judges, Bhopal tragedy was a module. So the sensitivity for judges which are required in such situation has been inculcated by the Judicial Academy to those judges who have undergone training uh, since the Academy started working in Bhopal. In fact, some of the judges have been taken to the site and, uh, and the challenges, the continuing challenges to the judiciary, they are faced. So there are no simple answers for it, but uh, the people will have to be aware that the judiciary has not adequately responded, which is a failure, which we need to acknowledge. Is there any topic which you might want to speak? Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, very optimistic about the, the future of law and justice in India. Uh, the, the Prime Minister has appreciated the role of law and the need for change and every speech he has been talking that if the judiciary were to take one step, the government uh, will take two steps. I mean, which is very promising. I mean, in other words, there is political will. We have a great reputation for quality justice all over the country, all over the world. And many other countries are looking towards India for synchronizing justice to the demands of the new 21st century. India is capable for that. Indian legal community is capable. We have now 14 national law schools. The new chairman of the Bar Council, Gopal Subramaniam, is wanting uh, quick reforms to happen in the legal profession. So I think judiciary, the legal profession, the academic community, the government, all are now realizing the role of law for access to justice, for a new India to be uh, given according to the constitutional vision. I think that is happening. So your generation will see that uh, I am in my evening of my life, but I am, I am optimistic that this is going to happen. Let it happen. Thank you. Let your verdict give us the answer. <laughs>